Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on population demography. So um, the study of demography looks at how the size of a population changes over time. So is the population increasing? Is it decreasing? What's the age structure? How many offspring are produced? How likely are they to die? Um, all of those kinds of things. So if you're looking at the size of a population, there's four things that influence how many individuals are in that population. Um, obviously, if there's births, that increases the population. If individuals die, that decreases the population. But you also have to consider um, individuals moving in from other populations, that would be immigration, and individuals moving out to other populations, which would be emigration. So uh, those four components um, influence whether the population is increasing or decreasing. Births and immigration increase the population. Deaths and emigration decrease the population. So when we're studying these animals, that's, that's what we're interested in is those different rates. Now, of course, the birth rate um, is influenced by the um, structure, the age structure of the group. So when you're looking at a, a particular population, uh, you often want to uh, break it up into um, different cohorts. A cohort is basically a group of organisms that were are approximately the same age. So if we were looking at humans, for example, you might consider all first graders a cohort. And you could follow that cohort through time to first grade, second grade, third grade, etc. Right? Um, usually with wild animals um, that have particular breeding seasons, like birds, for example, a cohort will be all individuals that are born in one summer. And then you can follow that cohort over time. So some various things you want, might want to know about that group is the fecundity. Fecundity is the average number of offspring produced per individual uh, within a given period of time. So you can say, okay, what's this group of birds fecundity in their first year of life? How many babies do they have when they're one year old? How many babies do they have when they're two years old? How many babies do they have when they're three years old? That's the fecundity. So that's one thing you want to know. You also want to look at the mortality. So what's the probability that any given individual is going to die within a particular period of time? So what's the, what's the probability of dying before you reach one year old? What's the probability of dying between one and two years old? Things like that. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at that, you can kind of build a, um, uh, a model of your population where you look at each cohort and look at how many individuals are in that cohort and um, what you build is basically an, an age structure model um, and you expect that you know between each year but as you follow a cohort a few individuals are going to die probably and some individuals may um, persist and so the the structure the age structure has a really um, important uh, influence on the population's growth rate so let's take a look at that so these are three different human age structure graphs from populations with uh, rapid growth, slow growth, and zero growth. So uh, humans in the modern era don't have very high mortality rates. So when you see a pattern like this where you've got a pyramid uh, shape where there's many more young people than there are old people, what's probably going to happen in that population is that those young people are going to grow up. Um, and when they become reproductively capable, they're going to have babies, and then the population is going to grow any, e even more. So what you tend to see is that wide, those wide steps moving up as the, those individuals age, and that indicates very rapid growth. Um, here, there's not as much of a difference um, in the old, uh, older, the number of older individuals and the number of younger individuals. So that, that indicates slow growth, and then this one. Uh, is uh, what a age structure would look like for a population with no growth. Um, you do see that there's a few younger individuals and there are older individuals. That just represents the fact that some individuals die as they age, okay? So uh, you can kind of um, make some assumptions based on these shapes about how quickly various populations are growing. Of course, the death rates are also going to be really important. Um, there's three um, typical patterns that you see in organisms uh, for their, um, their common death rates. Um, so you can have a type, what we call a type 1 survivorship curve. In a type 1 survivorship curve, there's very low mortality for an extended period of time, and then the, the organism goes through some sort of senescence or aging, and then you see a lot of mortality late in the organism's life. So humans are a great example of this, uh, at least humans in the modern era. Um, there's a very low probability that you're going to die when you're young. Um, it can happen, but it, it's relatively rare. And then when you reach a certain age and you, and you start to have age-related health issues, then there's a much higher rate of mortality um, in the late, later part of the life. So that's pretty typical of humans. Um, type 2 curve is an equal probability of surviving at, at any particular age. So as you go from 
you know, you have an equal chance of dying between zero and one years as you do between one and two years as you do between two and three years. Each year you have an equal chance of dying. Many birds um, have a type two um, uh, survivorship curve. And then finally you have the type three survivorship curve where most individuals die early in life and only a few survive, but once they sur once they pass this this early threshold, then they have a pretty high chance of surviving for the rest of their lifespan. Um, so things like plants tend to have a type three curve because you know if you think about an oak tree, it produces several thousand acorns. Most of those are not going to survive to be an oak. Most of them are going to get eaten by a squirrel, or they're going to uh, end up sprouting in the wrong place and die, or they get chomped by a deer when they're a wee little tree, something like that. So most uh, individuals die when they're very young, and only a few survive. Survive, but then once they reach a certain size, then they're very likely to survive for a long period of time. Okay? <clears throat> so this kind of plays into the life history of different animals. So how likely are you to survive for a long period of time? Um, now remember that uh, each animal is experiencing a selection that's going to attempt to maximize their, o their lifetime reproductive success. So the number of babies that they produce in their entire lifespan. Uh, but there's a trade-off between producing babies and survival. Um, producing babies is very costly. It tends to make, uh, you tend to use the resources that you would otherwise use to maintain your body um, in order to produce babies. And so um, it tends to shorten your lifespan to produce a lot of babies. But if you are an organism that has a high chance of dying in a short period of time, then it's worth the investment in babies right now in order to um, because you don't have, a, don't have very many opportunities because you're not going to live very long. So um, we have pictured down here um, two different extremes in, uh, of life history. This is a merganser. Mergansers generally live two to three years, so they have only maybe two or three opportunities to reproduce, and they tend to have a lot of babies all at once. Um, this is what we would call an R-selected species. R-selected refers to the growth rate. So they have lots of babies at once, um, but they don't invest very, very much in each individual baby. Um, so that's, that's one extreme. On the other extreme, we have an albatross. An albatross lives for 60 years. They produce one baby every two years. Um, so the albatross is what we call a K-selected species. K stands for carrying capacity. Um, and they tend to reproduce very slowly, but they live a really long time. So that trade-off between length of life and the number of babies you produce at a time means that each of these animals produces approximately the same number of babies in their entire lifetime. Um, because the albatross does it slowly over 60 years, and the merganser does it quickly over three years. Okay? Um, so that's the trade-off there. Um, and so then that, that tra you tend to see this trade-off in terms of the number of offspring per year when you compare uh, across species. So um, if you look at the probability of um, surviving, so the old adult mortality rate, is here's a 100% chance that you're going to die in a year. This is a 5% chance you're going to die in a year. And then this is the number of offspring that they produce per year. So you tend to see as you have species that survive long, uh, that are less likely to survive, these are the species that survive longer down here. These are the species that survive for a short period of time up here. Um, the ones that survive for a short period of time tend to have more babies per year, and the ones that survive for a long period of time tend to have long babies per year. So it's whether you're investing in yourself so that you can live a long time, or whether you're investing in your babies right now. Um, and uh, that's a, a pattern that we see across uh, a lot of different species. All right, so that plays into how quickly um, a, a population can increase. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can model population growth. Um, one way is with what we call an exponential growth curve. So with an exponential growth curve, um, the rate of increase um, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is like if you imagine that there, you have two bunnies and they breed and then you have four bunnies and then they breed and then you have eight bunnies and they breed and then you have 16 bunnies and then they breed and then you have 32 bunnies and each time they breed because there's more bunnies who are breeding the number of new bunnies that gets created increases that's exponential growth so get the the curve gets steeper and steeper and steeper as you go through time okay um, the problem with that is what happens when your backyard is now full of bunnies uh, can there is there any room for more bunnies there's not and so what happens is that most of the time 
um, the environment limits how many individuals can survive. And that's what we call the carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals that can be supported by the environment. And so while you often see exponential growth uh, when a, a new species gets introduced to a new environment where they start to go really, really fast, eventually they're going to become limited by the resources in that environment and their rate of growth of that population is going to tail off. And so you get this S-shaped curve here in blue, which is what we call a logistic growth curve. So logistic growth curves are extremely common in lots of different species. All right. So, um, and that, as I said before, that is what's, that's, uh, what's limited by the environment. Um, so there's some sort of shortage, it might be food, it might be nesting locations, it might be just space to live. Whatever that limitation is, that's going to prevent the population from getting any bigger. Um, a lot of times you do see this fluctuation around the carrying capacity where um, the population gets above carrying capacity, the, po the environment can't support that, that many individuals, and so some individuals die, and then it goes below, and then it increases, and then it goes below. So you tend to see that fluctuation right around the carrying capacity, it's pretty common. All right, so factors that limit uh, population sizes, uh, we do have those density dependent factors that give us those carrying capacities. Um, density dependent factors are any factor that depends upon the, the population size. So it has a bigger effect when the population is larger than it does when the population is smaller. So if there are limited um, cavities for a bird to nest in. There's only so many trees and only so many holes that a bird could go in and nest in, right? Um, if the population is small, it's not a limiting factor. It doesn't affect the, how the population grows because there's plenty of cavities for everyone. But when the population gets big, all of a sudden some individuals don't have a place to put their nest and so the population doesn't grow as fast. Um, so that would be a density dependent. Another example is predation. When the population gets very large, if there's a predator that depends on those animals, the predator's population usually increases and then that has a greater effect because there's many more predators to eat the individuals in the population than there would be if the population was small. Um, then there are also density independent factors. So these factors influence survival and reproduction regardless of how many individuals are in the population. So these are things like natural disasters, droughts, freezes, floods, um, and if there's a drought, a bunch of individuals are going to die. It doesn't matter whether there was a small population or a big population to start. If there's a drought, individuals are going to die. All right, that makes sense? Okay, um, so let's take a look at a few examples. So this is some data on um, density dependent factors in a population of song sparrows that live on an island. Um, so when there's a lot of sparrows on the island, um, which is over on this side of the graph, uh, what you tend to see is high juvenile mortality, so the youngs don't survive very well, and low reproduction. The, the female birds on the island don't produce very many babies. Um, so you would, that's probably due to not enough food resources on the island to support a population of this size. So some of the babies starve to death and the, the females don't have enough resources to make that many babies. If the population is very low on the island, then um, the, the females can produce many babies and those babies are very likely to survive. So those are density dependent. As the population size changes, the effect changes, okay? Um, here's an example of a density independent factor. Um, human factors are often density ind independent. So um, in the 1940s, a uh, pesticide called DDT was introduced. Uh, we thought it was going to be this miracle chemical that was going to allow us to completely eliminate things like mosquitoes, and it didn't cause any ill effects on the environment. Um, turns out that DDT is extremely toxic to birds, um, and in particular, it makes their eggshells very thin so that when the mother sits on the eggs, they crack. So this is uh, when this is the point at which um, DDT was introduced to Florida, and this is the population of eagles. Um, so the eagle population plummeted right after DDT was introduced. It wouldn't have mattered if there were 50 eagles or 5,000 eagles. Um, the DDT is going to have the same effect. So it's density independent. Does not uh, is not impacted by the number of eagles that are present. Um, a happy ending to the story, after DDT was banned in the 1960s, the eagle population has rebounded in Florida and is doing much better now. All right, um, catch the next lecture next time.